So welcome to the weekly charting analysis with CMC Markets. We've got the risk warning on the screen. Going to make our way through that. <coughs> Definitely an interesting week last week. Um, saw a big drop off in the dollar and a little bounce back when there was the non-farm payrolls on Friday. Difficult time for stock markets, but semblance of a recovery in uh, in oil, and definitely a massive rally in gold. So, um, <clears throat> which is continuing again today. So, definitely a lot of things going on. Mm. Well, I think the way we'll uh, we'll do things here is we'll just um, work our way through the uh, the indices, FX, and commodities, and if there's any extra. Um, you know, sort of non-core products that you're interested in or any side questions, let me know any time and we can, uh, we can get into that. Now, I'd say the thing, you know, the, the topics affecting global stock markets um, are you know, the same broadly that they've been the, the whole of this year, namely the sell-off in oil prices, um, concerned about China's economy, and, um, and the uncertainty surrounding um, the Federal Reserve policy, U.S. interest rate policy. Wanted to bring up fairly, um, you know, straight away here. When we're talking about prominent stock markets, you know, the DAX is right up there, the German DAX. You know, one of the most popularly traded index at CMC Markets, um, also um, well-watched in terms of uh, in terms of European equities, obviously, just because the German economy is the largest economy in Europe, so top 30 uh, companies in Germany not faring so well right now. Um, we've we've dropped through this 200-day moving average. You can see here that's happening today, and that follows a um, a drop through this fairly significant support area from November 30th. Um, and October, uh, so hold on, I'm talking about uh, from, from December 2014, then August 2015, then September 2015, and then we had a little brief bounce in January, and now we're dropping through it. So we closed below it last week, and now we're continuing that decline down into the 9,000 level, <coughs> which um, we haven't been at down at 9,000 since, uh, since 2014. So hitting some multi-year lows here in the, in the German DAX, and this, this is significant. This is significant technical development here. We've had, on, on this longer-term weekly chart that we're looking at, we've had lower highs being formed um, throughout, you know, most of 2015, going on again in this year, but this, the support has been holding. Now it's not holding. It's given way. Now, these things, these things aren't perfect, obviously. We've got another layer of support just below 9,000 from these lows back in 2013 uh, and 14. And obviously, this big spike flow down in October 2014. I would imagine, you know, that's a fairly significant level. I could imagine us getting some kind of bounce from there. But a lot of people pay attention to this 200-day moving average. It's a widely watched stock index. It's a, it's, it's a bearish omen. Now, we could obviously get a bounce back, close above the 200-day, get a good rally from here. That's entirely feasible, but, you know, this is a significant development, even if that were to occur. In terms of uh, Germany, we do have, um, you know, in terms of maybe looking at the German DAX and, um, and even the Euro, we do have a bit of German economic data this week, uh, German industrial production tomorrow on Tuesday, and uh, German GDP and CPI released on Friday. But really, um, you know, we do want to know generally how the European economy is doing and a sort of acceleration and deceleration in, in the growth outlook certainly impacts things on a sort of broader level. But really, it's, um, you know, we're, we're, with, we're in the same environment. We're the central bankers that are dictating the state of play. Now, if we do jump over to the euro, since I mentioned those economic data releases, I'm kind of jumping around a bit here, but um, let's talk about what's relevant. So obviously we talked about a big sell-off in the dollar. That was very evident in this breakout from this triangle pattern in the euro US dollar. We rallied all the way up to 112, getting a pullback now down to just short of 111. What was notable was that 
the euro on one of the days, I believe it was Thursday, rallies despite really quite determined comments from ECB President Mario Draghi to try and talk the currency down. Um, I, I say talk the currency down, but he was inferring strongly that there would be some extra monetary stimulus at the, 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 the March meeting for the European Central Bank. Um, and, um, you know, the, the typical result from that in the past has been that the euro would drop off um, on the prospect of um, further quantitative easing, lower interest rates. Didn't this time. Um, entirely dictated by diminished prospects for, a rate, for rate rises this year in the U.S., the dollar dropped off, and that drop off in the dollar superseded any, any potential weakness in the euro. So we had this um, big move higher where we moved over 100 pips on the day, you know, despite that, um, you know, those commentaries from, from Mario Draghi. So it's a reduced influence of the ECB here, which is interesting. Now, not only that, <clears throat> but um, I believe it was the prior day, on Wednesday, so where we saw the big breakouts uh, of the euro up to uh, up to above 111, after having been meandering below 110 for for months. Also in dollar yen, we saw this big breakdown in the dollar yen. So I, the same thing happened is that uh, we had Bank of Japan Governor Kuroda saying that uh, he could easily see an expansion in quantitative easing and a further cut of interest rates further into the negative. So uh, they've just cut interest rates to the negative in Japan. He was saying they could do it even further into the negative and said they could buy more assets. And keep in mind, the Bank of Japan already owns 40% of JGBs, uh, the Japanese um, uh, Japanese bond market. So, uh, you know, they're trying to push the pedal to the metal, these uh, other foreign bankers, but they're not having the effect they want because, you know, the desire there would be to weaken the yen from Kuroda. Obviously, we can see from this timber that took place here, that was not what happened. Actually, the, the yen strengthened quite significantly. And if we pull this chart out to the weekly chart, we can see that we're at a pretty significant level in dollar yen. And it's, it's, it's in a way no, no surprise that we're seeing similar, we're at similar significant levels on the, on the Dow, we're at similar significant levels on the DAX, which we just broke, um, because these are barometers for sort of risk, um, you know, dollar yen tends to move in sync with the Nikkei, which moves broadly in sync with, with, with other developed stock markets. So we're right here on this support. You know, if this 116 breaks, and, and FYI, I did do a currency snapshot video on this last week. Um, you know, if this 116 breaks, then uh, there's not a lot stopping us from getting down to 110, where we had that peak in September 2004. So this has been a very much a range-bound environment. And of course, we're always susceptible to false breakouts. Um, it's probably, you know, a default assumption that probably it would be the false breakout to start with, um, but that's not to say it can't eventually push down, and I would say like a close below for the day, and then the week below 116 um, is um, a definitely a big bearish development for this dollar yen chart. And look, the momentum's been down for uh, for a long time now, so we're just the price is starting to catch up with the momentum at this point. Now, I would mention Japanese data. I don't think it's too much significant this week, but to be honest with you, it's not really that that's driving this, this pair at the moment. It's the expectations of relative monetary policy and uh, it's kind of risk-on, risk-off attitude towards um, equities and other risky assets. Now, since I'm almost just looking at the biggest movers and the biggest critical levels at the moment, I'm just going to jump straight to gold because this has been the one to, to play in the last couple of weeks, it's fired higher. Mm -hmm. So if we get some um, perspective on this, downward sloping trend on the on the longer term charts here. But you see, and we've alluded to it before in these uh, in these webinars, there was a false break below this um, you know below this previous low. You know we got a push down there, but we really didn't make any headway below it. Made a lower low, but barely. And so. 
once we got back above that line again, which is about the 107273 area, we've pushed right back up to the previous highs, basically. That's where we find ourselves at the moment. So if we jump down to this daily chart again, we can see that it's basically between uh, between this peak here, which we managed to close above, got a drop back down through it. This was, um, I've taken it off the chart now, it's lost its significance, but kind of like this uh, this breakdown area here is where we found support, kind of this low here, something like that, using this. This is the, the prior box that I had on the chart, which basically we've got to pull back into that box. Now we're pushing up higher again in gold. And uh, it doesn't look like there's going to be too much in the way of stopping gold getting up to maybe test this big reversal level here. Um, it could be a struggle to initially get through that. It's about, let's see, what was the high on that day? It was about, um, it was 1183, pretty much on the money. Is um, it's going to be a difficult level to get through, and obviously just above that we have the round number 1190. Just short of it, we have the 1180. So it's that 1180, as I mentioned in the chart forum here, 1180 to 90 zone is a pretty significant resistance. But the trend is in uh, the trend. The short-term trend is pretty much in gold's favour at the moment. We're making higher highs and higher lows on the weekly chart. We're above the 200-day moving average, but um, you know. This is basically a failed downtrend, and so you'd imagine probably somewhere up here we're going to get a failed attempt at an uptrend, especially since we're below this, this long-term trend line here, and we're probably just going to find ourselves in a kind of choppy sideways market until we can make some more determined break to the top side. What would catalyze that break to the top side? Um, significantly reduced chances of, uh, of U.S. rate rises this year and probably just an all-out sell-off in, in stock markets. But if that sell-off in stock markets happened, gold could get caught up in it as well. I would suspect not as much so as happened in the, in the last big sell-off in gold that pretty much called the top just short of 2000. I don't think it's going to be so susceptible to sell-offs in equities as it was then because it's not a favorable asset that everyone's made a lot of money from. Back then, a lot of people were long gold, and that was one of their few profitable positions. And when the market started to tank, uh, they sold off gold alongside it. This time, you know, no one's sitting any big, any big long gold wins. It's obviously not far off multi-year lows. We're just we're kind of short cover, short covering rally off multi-year lows at the moment. So it may, it may act as a good hedge, and it has so far this year against the um, the volatility that we've seen in equity markets. So if we, um, if we move over to, to U.S. stock markets, the big event of the week is uh, Janet Yellen's testimony to the um, to the U.S. Congress, and uh, it would be, uh, the first day is on Wednesday, second day Thursday. Normally, it's all uh, about the Wednesday, what she says initially with regards to the U.S. economy, any hints she makes at monetary policy. Based on the last Fed statement, I would suggest she's probably not going to give too much away. Um, they're, they're staying very data-driven. Um, I suspect she's not going to really try and highlight too many big risks because um, I think they, you know, that's probably best left done to the, um, you know, to the meeting minutes and to the to the press conferences relating to the uh, relating to the Fed. But nonetheless, um, it's it, you know normally it's worth watching because she's obviously such an important figure. And she could say something of interest, but uh, normally it's just um, lawmakers uh, grilling her on pretty, un pretty unrelated issues to, to monetary policy. It's a, so it's a risk factor, and we're probably going to be uh, chopping around waiting for that. We've just broken below this rising trend line here on the, on the, on the US 30. Obviously, there's um, some concerns ahead of this, but um, you know, if nothing much different is said, um, it just leaves us in the same state of uncertainty that we are now with probably not much extra information. General state of play of things in, in U.S. stocks is that if we pull out to this weekly chart, <coughs> you can see 
this was the low from September. We got a false break through that low. We basically found support above this significant line here. This is this um, 15,350. It's kind of equivalent to the the German DAX level that we've already broken through. So some underperformance from European shares at the moment. Um, U.S. stocks relatively outperforming. That may not last long because some of the best performing U.S. stocks took an absolute hammering on Friday. Um, not sure if everyone saw that LinkedIn, uh, the social network, the professional social network, uh, I'm sure a few of you have profiles on there, uh, their shares tanked 40% on, on, on Friday in just one day. Uh, and obviously that, uh, that has been, you know, not for a while, but was at one point one of the, the high flyers. And um, it, um, it definitely had its uh, effects on the other big tech sector so, uh, stocks out there, uh, the likes of Facebook and, and Apple and Twitter. Twitter's obviously already fallen off a cliff, and uh, Apple does appear to have uh, topped out. So these big growth stocks that had allowed the U.S. stock market to outperform, um, not doing so well at the moment. If they continue to fall, they'll probably bring the overall U.S. stock market down with them. So that's the state of play here. <clears throat> you know, we're, I've drawn this line in to give us a little sense as to the general bias of things, but I think if we can hold above this low here, then we're probably pretty much in a sideways market. But it's 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 choppy. We we made a breakout here, made a higher high. We dipped um, a little bit further than you'd want in a healthy uptrend. Um, this you'd want to find support here. We dipped right down here. Couldn't get through the highs. Now we're dipping down again to the low. So really no trend at the moment. Um, so when it's a no trend situation, look at your overall bias. Um, mine at the moment, based on these weekly trend lines and this 200-day DMA, is still to the downside. So it's when it's a choppy range-bound environment, you know, you almost want to take more kind of speculative attempts at the top of, top of the range for selling. When you get to the bottom of the range, chances for buying, but then again, of course, you're going against that overall bias that you might have. Look at the UK 100. Similar little trend line that didn't have too much base. It's just two points on it, but we've seen a big sell-off through there today. Um, this, so when it comes to technical patterns, they, they don't always play out, obviously. Uh, but what can be useful if you are willing to change, <clears throat> you know, your viewpoint quickly, is that say here this could be argued to have been a um, inverse head and shoulders. Not perfect, but then they never are. Could call that 6, 100, uh, 6, 6,010, the neckline. Got a good push through there, but then just failed ever since and dropped back through it. That failure of that inverse head and shoulders pattern is a, um, a strong bearish sign in itself, because we had a bullish sign, but that was immediately uh, knocked out. And then so that failure of a bullish sign is, is actually quite a nice, strong bearish sign. So, you know, even if you took a break even or even a loss on that, on a breakout of this pattern, you know, if you're able to kind of turn your thinking around and think, okay, it's failed now, this has changed the dynamic, let's um, look for opportunities to sell. You know, obviously with the benefit of hindsight, we can say that that would have been the, the way to go. <laughs> So we're right now testing the, 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 the low of the year, and the low of the year is significant. You know, for those of you who attended before, we've already looked at this a little extensively. You know, it's the level back in November 2012. It's, um, it's, it's four-year lows, sorry, three, three and a bit year lows in the um, in FTSE 100. And we've got a few layers of support down there beneath, um, but, you know, certainly not indicative of any any real strength in the market. Okay. Um, we had a look at the euro. Um, I don't believe we looked at the pound. So we had a big, a nice breakout in the pound after a massive sell-off that began in December, most of the way through January. We've had a bit of a bounce back, pretty much all dollar related, and now that the dollar appears to have um, put in at least a short term bottom, you know, we've seen a bit of a top in the pound. <clears throat> and it has um, given way a couple of hundred pips now or more 
from from that peak. And so this, to me, um, where we had all these, <clears throat> where we had these massive swings for day after day, we eventually got the breakout, the retest, and then the opportunity to buy up to the. Um, you know, the previous long-term swing low here, and then we failed from there. That's kind of what's happened. And um, given that it's not, you know, that we've had no, absolutely no signals from the Bank of England that they're looking to raise rates anytime soon, um, you know, and we've always got this lingering Brexit threat, which not in itself is really a threat necessarily, but it's a bit source of uncertainty and could weigh on the Bank of England on whether they decide to raise rates or not. Those combined, not really much strength in the pound, so, you know, while the dollar remains um, a little bit stronger since those payrolls on Friday, um, we can expect the pound to be a little bit weaker. So but this breakout level um, would be, to me, the next logical area of, of, of support. Dollar yen we've looked at. Um, okay, so obviously crude um, down again today. <clears throat> we did actually finish last week, um, you know, not as positively as it um, initially looked at, might, like it might have been. So we did finish those last two days lower. So now looking at Brent, we kind of find ourselves in a situation where we pushed higher and, it, and weren't able to take out that high to make another higher high. This was significant support from back in December, so we basically support turned into resistance. We've dropped back. We haven't been able to push through that resistance yet. My feeling is that probably if this big push high wasn't, unable, wasn't enough to kind of catalyze people to want to jump in, then we're probably going to have to drift through that low and probably down close to $30 a barrel again. And that $30 to me really is the kind of pivot. While we're above there, there's some optimism that we've got a bottom. While below, we start attracting a few more momentum sellers to the downside and we could actually push to below uh, those, those multi-year lows. Looking at the general trend, you know, the, the, the bias is still very much to the downside. So if you, even if we are in a kind of slight basing scenario, there's still going to be everyone jumping on the, um, the momentum bandwagon to the downside while, we're, while technically we're still very much in a downtrend. And gold we've already touched on a bit. So um, unless there were any other questions near at the end here, I think probably best to, uh, to call it a day. Um, so good luck with trading this week. Big event is the uh, Janet Yellen's testimony on Wednesday. Got a few important, uh, obviously on the same day we've got oil inventories. Uh, one thing I didn't notice that last week we've got a big rally, even though there was a big stock inventory build. So, you know, look how oil markets react to that inventories data. If we get another build in, in U.S. weekly inventories, but nonetheless oil rallies, another sign that we've got a potential bottom in oil, that could be good for equities. Uh, we're below this 200 DMA on the DAX, you know, let's look how we can progress past that. Um, and uh, otherwise, good luck with trading, and thanks very much for attending. Jasper Law signing out.